If you're thinking about buying a new car and you're wondering which options are worth ticking, you've come to the right place, particularly if you're thinking about getting one of these, a new Porsche Cayenne. I've had three of these in almost as many years, each spec very differently. So I can tell you with some confidence which options are really worth having and which just aren't. In fact, I reckon I could save you somewhere around £121,556 just by making the right choices. So let's take a look at the options list. A few years ago, when my business was going really rather well and before anyone had even wondered what it might cost to live, I treated myself to one of these. Unfortunately, I'd only had it for about a year before somebody drove straight up my ass, pushing me into the path of an oncoming tree. And despite the onboard computer's optimism, the car was a complete write-off. Unfortunately, the replacement car supplied by the insurance company wasn't really spec'd how I wanted. So about a year later, I had the chance to swap it again, this time for a used car that had been spec'd up to the eyeballs. Now there is a new 2024 model out now, but the options are pretty much the same. So to start with, you have to decide which model and which engine size you're going to go for. This is a really easy decision because apart from the fact that cars don't actually have engines anymore, just a huge hunk of plastic, this is the base model, which now kicks off at £76,000 Inc. VAT. And you can stop right there because it already takes you from 0 to 60 in 6 seconds and then up to a top speed of 154 miles an hour. Now you could spend another £15,500 on the Cayenne S and it will get you to 60 miles an hour one second faster and then up to 170 miles an hour. But I guarantee that unless you live in Germany you will have just blown fifteen and a half grand on a feature you will never ever use. Anyway, if you're somebody who likes throwing away perfectly good money for no good reason, then why not go the whole hog and get the GT Hybrid Turbo? That'll take you from naught to a fixed penalty in 3.6 seconds and then up to a top speed of 190 miles an hour, which will probably get you about six months in the slammer. And whilst we're here, don't waste your time with the hybrid engines either. I had a loaner from the garage and I have to say it was a beautifully engineered piece of equipment. But you're deluding yourself if you think you're going to save the polar bears by driving a hybrid Porsche. And nor are you going to save any money on petrol either, unless you're just driving around town, in which case one has to wonder why you're buying a 190 mile an hour car. So there we have it. I've already saved you £88,800 and we haven't even got to the tech options yet. You're welcome. But we can skip past the exterior options list pretty quickly too. After all, how much of your time do you spend on the outside of the car admiring it versus enjoying it from the inside? And unless you're driving a Range Rover the size of an Airbus A380, literally nobody is going to notice. You're just another one of the 41.2 million other cars on Britain's roads today, most of which, including this one, look pretty similar. And when it comes to the second-hand market, I think the functional extras on the inside of the car are much more likely to help the resale value than whether your car is painted in black or macaque monkey red. So save £7,546 and buy a black car. And you can skip past the wheels pretty quickly too. Someone spec this car with three grand wheels, which is just nuts. I had the free ones on my last car and they were just as nice. Not once did I ever think someone was looking at me thinking, oh, poor bastard, couldn't afford the proper wheels. And nor can you tell the difference in ride between the standard 20 inch rims and the 21 inch rims. But anyway, whatever you buy, you're going to curb them within six months and you're going to feel so much better curbing a standard wheel than one of your three grand boots. And whilst we're in the wheel department, do pick up the 20 inch collapsible spare wheel. For £297, that really is worth having. Twice now I've found myself by the side of the road with a tyre that wasn't going to be reinflated with one of those stupid cans of sealant. So there we go, we've saved £99,165 so far. So let's go and see where we can spend it on the inside. Unfortunately, you're going to have to start off by spending £3,000 and slaughtering a few cows for the full leather option mainly because it gets you this leather-clad dashboard, which just looks and feels so much more luxurious than the plastic version. 
Next, you're going to have to choose which seats you want to have. And the thing to remember here is that Porsche isn't going to sell you an uncomfortable seat. They make three versions. They make an eight-way adjustable seat, the standard one. Then you can have a 14-way adjustable seat and then a massive 18-way adjustable seat, though God only knows what you'll be adjusting with that one. What I can say is that I've got the standard seats on this car and I did try the 14 wear just once and they were just no more comfortable. I think you can go with the standard ones and you'll be very happy with them. Then you can have seat heating or ventilation, which I guess depends on whether you live in London or Dubai. But if you do go for seat ventilation, then you also have to upgrade the seats and that's going to add another £2,000 to the bill. Now Porsche does also make ventilation for the rear seats, but I can't imagine why anyone would spend that sort of money on the passengers travelling in economy. There's also a massage option for the front seats, which I haven't tried, but I'm sceptical. Wouldn't it be a bit of a safety hazard? I have a nasty feeling that with a nice warm massage I'd be asleep by Junction 3 of the motorway. So all in all, I think most people can save £3,820 and just go with the standard heated seats. Next on the list is the off-road package, but who the hell is going to drive one of these things off-road? Except perhaps to find a parking space at Badminton Horse Trials. So you can save yourself a very easy £1,389 here. Next, we've got the exterior options, but as I said earlier, you can skip straight past the whole lot of it and save yourself £7,375. Next, roof and transport systems. Now, my first car did have the panoramic roof and I did like having that nice airy feel to the inside of the car, but I miss it a lot less than I thought I would. It gets dirty and if you park under a tree, open the roof and drive off, your wife is going to scream at you for covering her hair in shit that falls off trees. Then there are roof rails, but if you're a Porsche driver, are you going to be the sort of person who wants to put heavy suitcases onto the roof of your car? I think probably not. Although maybe you've got a man to do that sort of thing for you. And then finally, there's the tow bar option, which is very cool. It deploys at the press of a button. But again, if you're a Porsche driver, are you going to want to strap a horrible great lump of dirty plastic on the back of your car? I think maybe not, although tow bars can also be useful for transporting bicycles. Otherwise, save yourself £2,907. Next, lettering and decals. No! Just no! That is the easiest £1,084 you are ever going to save yourself. Then we've got rear axle steering, which I haven't actually tried, but I gather it makes the steering a little bit more responsive, and it also reduces the turning circle of the car by a massive 60 centimetres. The thing is, in the three years that I've had one of these cars, not once have I ever sat there thinking, God damn it, I wish this car turned in a 60 centimetre smaller circle. So you can save yourself a very easy £1,325 there. The next choice isn't really a choice at all. It's air suspension and it's well worth having. Not because it allows you to raise and lower the height of the car, which is not something you'll actually ever need to do, but because it makes the ride noticeably more comfortable. And as a bonus, it'll also stiffen up the suspension at the press of a button for better cornering on country roads. Now it's time to look at the a la carte menu where you'll find Porsche Dynamic Chassis Control, which stiffens the suspension in corners and makes the car roll a bit less, making you feel a little less on country roads. But I tell you what, I didn't have it fitted on my first car, but somebody has specced it on this one, and I have found the effect is quite subtle. I mean, you do notice it, but I think you really have to be caning it to get the full value. Certainly my wife still complains of feeling sick on country roads, so I think you might be better advised to save the £2,546 and take your wife to Paris for the weekend instead. Now we come to one of my favourite options, which is Sport Chrono, which gives you a slightly daft second hand on the dashboard, but it also gives you a rocket launch button on the steering wheel, which you press just before you're about to overtake 
Strike for maximum power! <laughs> it also gives you launch control, whereby if you're at a standstill, you can hold the car on the brakes, mash the accelerator pedal, let go of the brakes, and the car will lift off with maximum acceleration. If I'd had one of these cars when I was 18, I think I probably would have used that at every set of traffic lights. But now that I'm 58, oh, less so. In this section, you can also ignore the sports exhaust system and tailpipes. I mean, who on God's earth spends £2,213 making their exhaust a little bit noisier or their tailpipes a little shinier? Then we've got ceramic composite brakes, which I would rather like, but not because it slows the car down a bit faster, but because it gets rid of that black brake dust. But for £7,600? I think I'll carry on washing my hands after I've checked the tyre pressures. When it comes to headlights, do pick the top spec HD Matrix headlights. They're well worth the money, particularly if your eyesight isn't what it once was. What they do is they put the beams onto full beam all of the time, and then using some strange magic, they track the car coming towards you and carve a hole in the light so as not to dazzle them. It's a very impressive effect, actually, and it allows the headlights to stay on full beam up the inside, allowing you to see a little bit further. And as a bonus, you don't have to remember to dim your headlights anymore. Then you can choose to have the car fitted with an electrically heated front windscreen. Now, I'm not entirely sure why, but somebody spec this car with a heated windscreen and an auxiliary fuel burning heater that sits in the engine compartment. And then on cold winter's mornings, you can lean out of your bedroom window, zap the car with the remote control, and it's all toasty warm by the time you leave for the office. Thing is, I'm not quite sure why you'd want the auxiliary heater and the heated windscreen. So unless you live in Siberia, I'd probably opt for the auxiliary heater. Next, you can have thermally and noise insulated glass. Now, my first two cars didn't have it. This one does. And I struggle to tell the difference. Now, I'm as deaf as a bloody doorknob, so I might not be the best person to judge, but I'd be inclined not to bother and save £1,287. Under transport and protection, there's another must-have option, and you'll be glad to hear it's the cheapest option on the list. It's the plastic luggage compartment liner, well worth having, and it's £91. Go on, treat yourself. Next, it's the interior packages and decors. Now, I said earlier that you could waste an awful lot of money on the exterior of this car, and it turns out the same is true of the inside. I mean, who spends 400 quid putting a Porsche logo on the headrest of their seat? Or red seat belts, for that matter. The only thing worth having in this section is the standard heated steering wheel. Otherwise, save yourself 10 grand. This car doesn't have any of it and it's still a very nice place to sit. The same goes for the interior design section, because unless you're an Arab sheikh with one too many oil wells, you're simply not going to spend £2,175 on a set of illuminated door sills. Same goes for everything else in this section, except perhaps the floor mats, but even those you'd be better off waiting until the next section to buy the cheaper rubber ones that cost £131 and are much more durable. Finally, we've come to my favourite section, which is, of course, the technology section, starting with the head-up display, which projects various bits of driving information, such as your speed, RPM, navigation directions, that sort of thing, onto the windscreen in front of you. I'm slightly in two minds about this, because on the one hand, I do love the way it makes me feel like a fighter pilot, but on the other, well, it has become slightly second nature to glance down at the map on the dashboard for directions, and the arrows that it projects on the windscreen can be ambiguous. But on balance, I do like the way it automatically displays the speed limit on the windscreen to remind me when I'm doing 150 miles an hour through a 30 mile an hour zone, and I also do like being made to feel like Tom Cruise in Top Gun. So on balance, I think I'd spec it again. Next, we've got Night Vision Assist, which sounds incredibly cool. It's an infrared camera that's mounted on the front of the car and can see 350 metres beyond the range of your headlights. It's sort of like night vision goggles for your car. 
If it sees a human or an animal, it flashes a warning up on the dashboard, and if it sees a human, it actually points a beam of light at them momentarily just to draw your attention to them. The thing is, in over 30 years of motoring, I've never actually run anybody over. Actually, that's not strictly true. I did once run over a pedestrian as they jumped off a bus. They were blind drunk and I was on a motorbike, so night vision wouldn't have saved either of us. So I think I would really struggle to justify £1,775 on the vanishingly small chance that it's going to stop me running over somebody who's 350 metres beyond the range of my headlights. Sadly, the next option isn't actually optional anymore. It's self-parking and it now comes as standard, which I think is a bit of a shame actually. I think Porsche should have kept the base price down and allowed people to choose the better option, which is learning how to drive. The same goes for surround view, which I had on my first car, and I've been surprised how little I've missed it on this one. Next, for £639, you can have Lane Change Assist, which senses whether there's anything behind you, and then flashes an LED warning light in your wing mirror if there's anything in your blind spot and you're about to crash into them. That's very well worth having. I think the next option is probably the most underrated option on the list. It's called Porsche InnoDrive and it's Porsche's self-driving autopilot feature. Although it's not really an autopilot, it's more of a driving assist. Now I guess most people who buy these cars probably look at it and think, I'm buying a Porsche, I'm going to drive like a swivel-eyed loon all the time, I don't want a, an autopilot. But that's a big mistake. Even the most enthusiastic driver doesn't want to drive like a maniac all the time. And when you're just going from A to B, I've found that this system probably reduces fatigue by, well, maybe as much as 30-40%. First, it controls the throttle and braking, slowing you down automatically if it sees a car in the road ahead, in stop-start traffic, if it sees a speed limit sign, or a bend in the road. It does this on any kind of road, even on A roads, and it certainly made me better at observing speed limits. Porsche says it also makes the car more efficient, so it'll increase the number of miles you'll get from your gallon. Although I suspect that if you're driving one of these cars, that's probably not something that's keeping you awake at night. It also controls the steering. The problem is, it doesn't do it quite so well. I mean, it works brilliantly on the motorway where it'll keep you running down the centre of the lane with absolute laser-guided precision. The problem is, on A roads, I find it tends to give up about a third of the way into the corner. So don't think this thing is going to drive you home safely after a night out on the tiles. The best that can be said is that by the time you hit the middle of the hairpin bend, you'll be going quite slowly. Still, this is the must-have optional extra for this car. On long journeys, it just means that you arrive at your destination that much less knackered, because you've had to concentrate that little bit less. Whew, we're nearly there now, you'll be glad to hear. We're now into the comfort and usability section where there's only one thing you'll want, and I mentioned it earlier, it's the auxiliary heater, which warms the car up before you head off in the morning. The strangest addition to the options list this year is a second TV screen for your front passenger. The thing is, car sickness is caused by the conflicting signals from the liquid in your vestibular system in your ear, which is telling you that you're bouncing up and down, and your eyesight, which when you're looking inside the car, is telling you that relative to the car, you're not. And the easiest way to get rid of car sickness is to look outside the car at the horizon to remove that conflict. So I'm certainly not going to buy a system that's going to make my passengers Uncle Dick, and in any event, I think long journeys are meant for chatting away and listening to the radio. Then you've got the option to upgrade the sound system and I strongly recommend you go for the Bose which costs £1,052. It sounds significantly better than the standard system even to my deaf old ears. And the last thing on the options list is something I'd avoid like the plague. It's a dash cam and in my case that's more likely to be self-incriminating than provide evidence that the accident was somebody else's fault. And anyway, you don't want to be reporting other people's behaviour these days because sod's law it'll be somebody who's just got out from prison for GBH and they'll find out where you live.
At the start of this film, I said I could save you about £120,000 if you're buying a Porsche Cayenne. In fact, by the time I totted up all of the unnecessary options, including the bigger engines, I actually found £170,000 worth. Although that did include some of the more bonkers things, like a £600 vehicle documentation folder and a £700 car key. In fact, the bigger engine cars do come with more stuff as standard, so you can't save quite as much as that. Still, the bottom line is that the base model is a fabulous bit of kit. It really is such a nice car to drive. And if you need a large car, as I did, the Cayenne doesn't shout fuck off to the whole of the rest of the world quite like a Range Rover. Although the base model now costs more than it did when I bought mine, the principle is the same. For the same price as a Cayenne S with no extras, you can have a base one with leather, self-driving, better headlights, air suspension, heated seats and steering wheel, and a Bose Hi-Fi, all of which you're going to enjoy far more than whether the car does 154 miles an hour or 170. These things should also make your car far more desirable on the second-hand market too, something that's going to be important for me now that I'm reaching that stage in life when really I should trade it in for something more age-appropriate, like a Honda Jazz. Of course, the moment you drive a new car out of the showroom, its value drops like a stone, so if I were to sell mine now, I probably wouldn't get enough to buy a Jazz, or a Bacon Butty for that matter. So perhaps I'll hold on to it for a little while longer, at least until the charging network gets better anyway. Now whilst we're on the subject of cars, I'll put a link over there to a tracking device I reviewed a little while ago. If you're buying an expensive car, that might be worth having. Meantime, till the next time, I've been Arlo Guthrie. Bye bye.